Thank you all so much for being here. I've done four events in the last month that it rained. And, <laughs> and at, one four, at one four people came. The next one, nobody came. The one after that, I had to bring my own people. Um, and today, it's a beautiful day here. And we know you have a choice of airlines, so thank you for flying with us. I'm not going to use the podium much because podiums are not my friend. I usually look like a bobblehead behind them, so I walk around. But I want to tell you where this book came from. In 2017, I was asked to speak at an Army event. This next week is the Army's big symposium, so it was at one of those. I was a substitute. The main speaker had dropped out and, well, I was probably number three on the list, but they called me. And I had already been saving some of these stories about women from World War II and men because the greatest generation continues to pass from this earth. And one of the first stories I found was about a woman who escaped from the Nazis. And another was a woman who'd served in the OSS undercover as a counterintelligence agent. And I was fascinated. So I used these stories in that session, and then I didn't quite know what to do with them. So I kept collecting these stories in a large folder. Now, by 2019, I was watching the Emmy Awards. Anybody watch The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel? OK, so in that Emmy presentation, Alex Borstein received the award for Best Supporting Actress. And when she got up, she said, in World War II, my grandmother was about to be shot into a pit. And she turned to the guard and said, what happens if I step out of line? And he said, well, I don't have the heart to shoot you, but somebody will. She stepped out of line. And for that, I am here today. And for that, my children are here today. So step out of line, ladies. Step out of line. And thus, I knew what I was going to do. So my agent told me, nobody will buy this book. No, no publisher will want this. There's too many people in it. <laughs> Why don't you cut some of them out and only have three or four? And I said, no. I'm not going to do that. I don't want to lose any of these terrific stories. Because as I continued to build this book, I found connections between so many of them. And for those of you who've read it, Thank you, thank you. You know this isn't your <clears throat> typical history book, because I wanted you all to know them as the people I know. They're n it's not a dry history book. These are real people to me. And I know them as 17 and 18 years old, ready to take risks and find their way. And I also talk about them afterwards, because most books you read talk about those four years of the war. Well, your whole rest of your life is there. What does that mean? So I want to talk about their lives and what it has taught me, and I hope to share that with you. So the first person I want to talk to you about is Hilda Eisen, the first story I found. I read Hilda's obituary in the Wall Street Journal in 2017. She had just passed away <clears throat> at the age of 100. She was born in western Poland, about 83 miles southwest of Warsaw in a small community where she was the second of seven children. Her father owned a bakery, and she was happy growing up until the Germans invaded. By then, she was 19, newly married, and she and her husband, David, were not living in the same community then where her parents and the rest of her family were. They were captured, taken away, and put into the ghetto in nearby Lublin. She and her husband stayed on the run for two to three weeks before the Nazis caught up with them, and they too ended up in that ghetto. They escaped. Hilda went to the guard at the gate and said, I need to get out, and I need to do a little shopping. I'll be right back. He opened the gate, and away they went. <laughs> Into the forest, and this is one of these deep forests where the sun never touches the ground, and they spent the next four years there fighting the Germans. One day, Hilda is out gathering firewood, and a Gestapo patrol stops her, takes her to a nearby school building, and she happened to have a weapon on her, so that didn't bode well either. And they were going to interrogate her that night. 
She's in a room, locked in, and she hears them interrogating someone else down the hallway. And she said, I am not going to take this. And without thinking any further, she opens the window and jumps from the second story. Breaks a bone in her foot, runs through the night, back to the forest. Escaped a second time. Now, we come to the end of the war. Her husband has been killed by the Polish people. And she returns to her hometown, as do several others, including some young people who had survived Auschwitz. <clears throat> One of them was Harry Eisen, who she remembered from junior high. They don't know what's happened to everyone else, just that the town is empty. The only thing she has of her family is a little piece of embroidery that hung on the wall in the kitchen. And now they have to decide, what do we do? So these four young people decide they will go forward together. She and Harry make their way out of Poland down to Munich, Germany, where the next two years they live in a displaced persons camp. There's no jobs. There's no food. There's no money. There are people talking about where do we go, what do we do next. This is what is called liminal time. Does anybody know that term liminality? I didn't. Good. I'm glad you didn't either. So. <laughs> So I had to look this up, and in most of my communications newsletters, I'd seen the definition of it. The time in between, the time after a major world event, such as a pandemic, a global war, earthquakes, where there is a time of the open door, where we are not quite ready to move on yet, but we know we can't go back. And we still hear people say, let's get back to normal. Is there any going back? We have to go forward. And the only way is to go forward. So they spend two years in that camp trying to decide what's next. Finally, Hilda writes to a distant cousin in California who sponsors them <clears throat> to move to the US. Now, when you see the Holocaust exhibit, you'll see quite a bit about immigration and how difficult it was for refugees to come to the US. Once they're there, then what? They don't speak English. He gets a job in a hot dog factory, and they're trying to make ends meet. Now, I'll come back to their journey in a minute, but I want to talk about where we are as well. This is what they had to leave. This is Warsaw. When General Eisenhower visited Warsaw in September of 1945, he said it was the most destroyed part of Europe he had ever seen. There is nothing here. You have to go on. You have to go away from here. You have to go forward. So we talk about the pandemic and the term liminality. If you look on social media, uh, Pinterest, there are also playlists for liminality. And what it is about is emptiness, that same emptiness that was the destroyed city of Warsaw. Empty classrooms, empty movie theaters, empty shopping malls. Do we remember seeing those faces in auditoriums and baseball games? We want to forget, right? We don't want to go back to that, but there's that anxiety of, are we going to go through this again this winter? Is there going to be another surge? Is there going to be something else? So I think we are still in liminal time. Now, despite the grief, despite the loss, there are some things that have happened that have been positive. A little bit of improvement in the environment, maybe a little bit of a movement towards electric vehicles. The people who are lucky and get to work from home or the beach. <laughs> change in hiring practices. And then a change in art. If you've been to the Van Gogh exhibit, where you get to walk in and you can see it and be immersed in it. Some of it is so dizzying, I had to sit on the floor to watch it. And then, that, and then the, one of the pictures winks at you, and that was, that was a little much. <clears throat> So we have all of this change that we're grappling with, what's happened in schools, what's happened with business. What about the great resignation that is now becoming what? The big stay. And then there is my favorite, Zoom. <laughs> Anybody else tired of Zoom? Yeah. But I'll tell you, it was, a, it was a couple months ago I realized that in my Zoom program there's a button that says, would you like to improve your appearance? Well, well, yes, I would. I would like to. And so I pushed it. And what it does is make you fuzzy. But you know what? I'll take that. <laughs> it's 
So if you want to Zoom with me, I look good now. <clears throat> but let me come back to Harry and Hilda. So there they are in California near Los Angeles. Now they've been there about a year. They have their first child. It's Christmas time and there's a knock on the door. A knock on the door for those five years that they were on the run or he was in Auschwitz and they were at height. It brings it all back, that fear and that fear that things are going to happen again that are bad. They don't answer the door. They look out through the curtains, wait till the people leave, then open the door and realize it's the neighbors who have brought Christmas presents for the baby. And so to me, that is the moment that they were able to move forward. They started to save their money and they bought a few chickens. Harry sold eggs on the back of his bicycle. Hilda would box them up. This is a picture that hung on their corporate headquarters wall. By the time they sold that business, Norco Farms, Norco Ranch, in 2002, they had 450 employees, 800,000 chickens, and they supplied every major outlet west of the Mississippi in this country. And you think what they came from, no language, no money, nothing, and what they built. I'm still amazed at that. But I want to tell you about a few other people who've also been through the same struggles. Now, one of my favorite stories in this book is the story of Charity Adams. <clears throat> Charity Adams grew up in Charleston, I'm sorry, in Columbia, South Carolina, and was working on her master's degree at Ohio State when she decided to join the Women's Army Corps in 1943. Actually, it was the Auxiliary Corps then. It became the Women's Army Corps just a bit later because she wanted to serve. So she joins the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, and they sent her to Fort Des Moines, Iowa. Mm. <laughs> Anybody here former Army? Yeah. Anybody work in basic training? That's what she had to do was work in a basic training unit after she became the first African-American woman to be commissioned in the U.S. Army. So she commands a basic training unit, which is boring. <laughs> Every six to eight weeks, you do the same thing all over again. You teach them how to salute, say, yes, sir, no, ma'am, how to march, and then away they go, and you get a new group. She wanted a bigger challenge. She wanted to serve to the best of her ability. Now, I have her autobiography. I signed the contract to write this book in January of 2020. What happens in February? Everybody closes. I couldn't go to any library. I couldn't go to a museum. I couldn't go to the Holocaust Museum. I couldn't get anything from anyone. People would be happy if I actually called them, or I was happy if they actually answered. And they would say, oh, but we can't go in and get that for you. Sorry. So I started buying books online. And a great many of these people wrote autobiographies in 1946, 47. So I have her original story in her words. And in some ways, this was so much better because you get a better understanding of what they went through at that time. And she talks about how, while she was at Fort Des Moines, she began to teach herself how to be a higher level commander. She learned logistics. She volunteered to travel with the WAC band. She sold war bonds. She did just about everything. And when they tell you in the Army, don't volunteer, and someone does, they're going to get everything. So, and she did. So in January of 1945, she finally learned she's been promoted to major, and she's going to get that opportunity to command a battalion. This is a big deal. She was supposed to go to command and staff college, but instead she's being given this opportunity and to serve overseas. So here's the envelope with her orders in it, and they say, don't open these until you're over the water. She looks down, there's a Chesapeake Bay, that's close enough. <laughs> Opens it up and discovers she's going to be the commander of the brand new 6888 Central Postery, Postal Directory Battalion based in Birmingham, England. What is the mission? Fix the backlog of mail. Because of the pace of operations, some soldiers hadn't received mail for over two years. Other units had been given this mission and failed. So here comes Charity Adams. She meets the commander of the COMZ, the communications zone. They were behind the front lines. And he says, so, Charity, 
How are your troops? Can they march? She hasn't met them yet. Now, when you read about World War II, the larger units, the infantry divisions, some of them trained for two years before going over. She met them when they got off the boat. And that boat had been chased by submarines, Nazi submarines, and so some of them were a little shaken by that. But she meets them. They have this parade. And that's why we have more pictures of her at that time and of her unit, because that was videoed in the, t in the city of Birmingham. <clears throat> They're staying in a, what was a closed up school. So after that parade, the next day we go to work. And she takes them into the warehouses, they open the doors, and there it is. 17 million pieces of mail stacked to the rafters. Some Christmas packages with food in them. You know, little rat eyes in the dark having, having snacks. And so she decides how she's going to do this. She divides them up into shifts. They work 24 hours a day. Each shift clears 65,000 pieces of mail. She has 855 women in this unit. Two are from Colorado, one from Pueblo and one from Denver. Because I've seen the list of where they're all from across the country, all over. So they're given six months to complete this mission. How long do you think it took them? Three, you bet, she did it in three. Oh, you read the book. <laughs> okay. So what happens in the Army if you do well at something? So then they clear all of the diplomatic mail in Rouen, France. End of the war, the drawdown is beginning. People are starting to go home. Charity is offered a promotion to lieutenant colonel and then an assignment in the Pentagon. I can relate to this. She says, the Pentagon, hmm, I've been there. I didn't like it. I got lost. So she leaves active duty, marries her husband who's going to medical school in Switzerland, and she finishes her degree, her doctorate, and later becomes the dean of women at two universities in Virginia. I'm sorry, in Ohio. This picture in the upper right shows the Congressional Gold Medal that is being minted now for the 6888. The WASP received their medal, I believe, in 2008. Some other units from this time have been so recognized. But it was a struggle to get to this point, especially during the pandemic. The first recognition this unit received was a meritorious unit citation from the Army. And then this bust of her and dedication to the unit at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Standing there is one of the advocates for the 6888. That's re retired Master Sergeant Elizabeth Helm Norton. And she's saying, we stand on their shoulders. So how did charity adjust after the war? What was her liminal period? They didn't, they didn't meet after the war. Now we think about there were parades. There was only one big parade in the United States. That was 1946. And it was the 82nd Airborne. And they practiced six months for that. Most people didn't co coordinate or cooperate to meet for 20 years. And then they started having reunions. I have one picture of her from the United States Postal Museum, where she was recognized in the mid-90s. And she said, well, it certainly took a long time for us to be remembered. President Clinton was there at that. I think he kind of went, ouch. <laughs> and there will be a stamp that comes out next year. There is a Netflix movie being made about them uh, that Tyler Perry is making. I think Kerry Washington plays her in the movie. Oprah plays her in later years. This should be out November, December on Netflix. So this movie will come out next year, but there's also going to be a Broadway musical. I heard one of the songs from it. It was great, but I still have this mental picture of women dancing in a circle, flinging envelopes, and singing. So, <laughs> But I'm sure it's going to be wonderful, absolutely wonderful. <laughs> and then there's two more people I want to tell you about. This is Kate Flynn on the, ne on the left. Kate was a nurse in World War II. Now, if you read some books about World War II, so I have the book about D-Day. It's about this thick. There are two lines in there about the women in World War II. Wow. The women in the Women's Army Corps were not treated well. Of course, that didn't happen to the nurses. Next page. That's about it. 
the nurses did not have it easy. Kate joined, like so many of her class, nursing school class, right as she, right as she graduated in 1943. She wanted to be a flight nurse. Training for flight nurse, nurses was in Florida at what was MacDill Army Airfield. So she goes to MacDill and then discovers the program is closed. She can't get in. But she meets her future husband there, so it's all good. <laughs> so now she's assigned to wherever, you know, the Army needs of the Army, a combat hospital, heavy casualty. 18 nurses in this hospital. Then they train at, in, in the South, and then they train in England. And they finally deploy two weeks after D-Day and land on Omaha Beach. So Kate is majestically tall, as I am. <laughs> and she goes under the waves. You know, they get off the ship. They're all carrying that 75-pound pack, and the taller nurses have to drag her to shore. Their equipment doesn't get there for another two weeks. They help out in the local hospitals, and then they're assigned to Patton's Third Army, and they follow Third Army throughout the rest of the war, through France, through Luxembourg, through Belgium, into Germany. She has five battle stars for her service. <clears throat> now, Kate never got promoted. She left the war as a first lieutenant because if she were promoted, where could she go? And she was needed where she was. Now, they were supposed to be behind the front lines, just behind the front lines, and triage their patients, stabilize them, and then move them further back. Sometimes they were shelled. Sometimes they were right at the front line, sometimes in front of it. And she said, what we would do is roll them out of the cots and lay on top of them until the shelling stopped. She said they had one German prisoner who demanded to be treated first, and she was like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> and then when he realized that she was going to treat everyone else before treating him, she said he behaved much better. So after the war, she meets up with her husband. But I had to actually talk to her children about some of the details when I'm writing about her because she too passed away in 2019. So I would ask her oldest daughter, Mary Ann, can you explain to me how your parents met up again after the war? Because her husband was in Japan. Now, they had seven children. So Mary Ann would say, I will have to call everyone and we will convene. <laughs> and so two weeks later, I hadn't heard from her and I was getting worried. And she finally called me back and said, we have talked. None of us know. <laughs> so now they feel badly they never asked the, asked the question. <clears throat> but now Mary Ann calls me a little later. She called me this last year and said, I want you to talk to my sister-in-law, Carolyn. And I said, OK, I'll talk to Carolyn, because Carolyn wants to talk about Mary Taylor Previty. Mary Taylor was not in World War II. She was a child in China. Her parents were missionaries. When the Japanese invaded China, all of the kids who were in an international school were taken captive. The school was surrounded and they were sent to a concentration camp. She spent five years of her childhood behind barbed wire, along with her brothers, two brothers and sister. When she grew up, she went to college, became a teacher, then joined the school board, and then was selected to run a juvenile detention center. Who better to understand kids behind bars than someone who spent five years of their childhood in the same kind of situation? And she was good at it. But when I talked to Carolyn, she said, you know, I read your book, and I was so excited to read about Mary Ann's mother, Kate, because I knew Kate. But then I realized that there was this other chapter that was all about Mary Taylor Previty. She was my neighbor growing up in Haddonfield, New Jersey. Now, what are the chances of that? That's what I mean about these connections that I keep finding, how people knew each other and knew of each other. So she tells me about how one summer when she was a kid, her, <clears throat> her mother was at a barbecue at Mary Taylor Previty's house. And there might have been mimosas and Bloody Marys involved, but the discussion was, what's wrong with our country? This is the time of Nixon, just after Vietnam. 
What are we going to do to bring back civility? What are we going to do to bring back patriotism? And they decide, we're going to have a parade. We're going to have a Fourth of July parade. This picture on the right is one that she sent me of that flag that they created. It takes 12 kids on either side of that to carry that. And so they had a parade that year. And then for the next 50 years, that flag was carried in the Haddonfield, New Jersey, Fourth of July parade. Mary passed away in 2019. 2020, there was no parade. So this picture is from the parade in 2021. And you can kind of see in the background this really ugly float, which is meant to be a plane. And there were, there were six men who dressed up as paratroopers walking in that parade. And, and the children would pass out flyers telling Mary's story to keep the story alive. In this picture, you see her holding a piece of a parachute that's been embroidered. Because after the 17th of August, VJ Day, victory over Japan, some of the Japanese soldiers didn't know the war was over. And the Office of Strategic Services, the precursor to the CIA, had offices in China. They were concerned that the Japanese were going to kill the prisoners. So they sent in teams to each of these camps to liberate them. There were six young paratroopers who've, who jumped into Mary's camp to rescue them, including a translator for the Chinese and translator for Japanese. Now, Mary by this time is 12 and a half, and these are good-looking young men. <laughs> and all of the teenage girls who were quite interested in them took one of the parachute, parachutes, they all embroidered it, and then gave it to them. She has it back in this picture, taken from the 1990s, because she was going to run for state office and decided that she needed to do a pilgrimage to find every one of them and thank them for saving her. These are my falling angels, she would say. So those are the stories that I keep finding that I think give us all reason to say, we too can come through this period of liminality. We are in this period of the open door. And what's next? Well, we are back together, but are we fully present? <laughs> and we need to be fully present to build community. I think this is a tremendous community here, and I can't tell you how honored I am to be here with all of you. We see right now in this country an epidemic of loneliness. We see a lot of stories about that. Recently, I just read that this year in a test of high school eighth graders across the country, only 18% could pass knowledge about civics and how democracy works in its processes. 30% of adults are now being diagnosed with depression. What do we do with this? Exactly what all of you are doing, coming together on a beautiful day in this sunshine to talk about where we go and what we do from here. We need to teach civics. We need to teach social responsibility. And I think we really need to talk about a commitment to civility, which is, if anybody's flown lately, you know exactly what I mean by that. So tomorrow when I fly back, it will be at 6 in the morning, and hopefully no one else will be awake. <laughs> but I want to thank you all for listening to me talk about these people who I know, and I know so well. And since this book has come out, I've come to meet so many people who say, I knew them. I knew Stephanie Check. She was my neighbor. Or Mary Baracco, I used to cut her grass when she lived in Norfolk. So I find people who knew them, who were impacted by them. And for those of you who had parents or grandparents who served at that time, I hope you have their stories too. But I'd love to answer any questions you might have. But thank you for listening to me. <laughs>